Listen, for this story to make sense, I'm gonna have to start from the beginning. March 2006, ski a mountain for a first time. Oh, bless, man, to have my parents introduce me to skiing at such a young age. I was only six years old in that clip you saw. Now, if I wanted to take skiing to the next level, man, I, I only had two options. I could either join the race team or the freestyle team at my local hill. Well, I was only six years old at the time, so believe it or not, my parents made that decision for me. Off to the races I went. Is that Nicholas now? Yep. And I'd actually go on to ski race for another six years. So ages six through 12, my parents brought me to the hill three nights a week to ski gates. <laughs> Let's go. Now, when I was just starting out, I was having a blast learning how to ski, trying to go faster and faster, you know, moving away from the pizza, getting towards the French fry action. And then once I got really comfortable on my skis, I actually ended up doing quite well in a couple of races. I, you know, I think I, uh, do I still have any, any medals? Yo, I have a slinky. Oh, you won't be able to see him too well because my camera's brutal, <laughs> but I got a couple third places and one second place. And then this big old cowbell at the Jasper Junior Olympics. By no means whatsoever was I set in the pathway to Olympic ski racing. Like I really wasn't that great, but I got myself on top of the podium a couple times and buddy, that earned me a couple Tootsie Rolls. So I was stoked. Now I got a lot of love and a lot of respect for ski racing. Without it, I wouldn't be the skier I am today. But man, did I ever, get... I'm so sorry to say, I got so bored. <laughs> I'm so sorry to say it to any racers out there. Like I remember I was just bummed going to practice, dude. Like I was not stoked to put my ski boots on just to ski the same course over and over and over again. I just wasn't motivated to go faster or improve any of my previous times. And because of that lack of motivation, dude, the stoke was not there. Now, to be honest with you, I don't remember a lot about my ski racing days because I'd spend each and every practice looking at the other side of the hill because that's where the park was. Eight years old, I was awestruck watching the freestyle team, dude. They were launching their bodies up into the stratosphere. They were skiing on metal poles. Like, the things you're supposed to hold on to when you're going down some steps. That blew my mind. <laughs> like, for real. Now, there is a silver lining to be had here in my little race career. <laughs> I'm not sure how familiar you are with ski racing, but once you get a little bit older, you can actually ski full-size gates in a slalom course. That man, 11, 12-year-old me was now allowed to whoop the gates, buddy. I, um, I was hyped. I was so stoked. And fast on the bottom section of the course. Now, believe it or not, cross-blocking is it's not for style points. You'll see the skiers do it because as a racer, you want to get the quickest time possible. That's how you win a race. <laughs> To get the quickest time, you got to ski really close to that gate. So unless you want the gate to hit you, you need to you need to hit it now buddy rest assured 12 year old me was not cross blocking for speed purposes dude i just had a blast hitting these things coming up to the gate like it was a huge slap sound dude oh my goodness was it ever satisfying but needless to say after a year of my newfound joy it, it got boring as well <laughs> shoot man it sucked so after the snow melted that season 12 year old me called a family meeting mom dad listen turning 13 next year i'm gonna be a teenager teenage years man otherwise known as the era of wisdom tried to explain i, I just had this prepubescent feeling that i needed to join the freestyle ski team they weren't too excited about the idea nicholas there's risks involved i said mom and dad you're right and that was the end of that conversation. <laughs> but man, I was persistent. I kept asking and asking and eventually come next fall, they signed me up for the freestyle ski team, buddy. And the rest is history, man. We'll get to the broken bones. I promise you, hang in there, you sadistic fools. <laughs> For you guys that don't know, I was actually a freestyle ski coach for two years after I competed. And it was really interesting for me to coach somebody who was transitioning to the sport from ski racing versus somebody who was just starting to get into it. With the ski racer, they already had a fundamental base of good skiing habits. They knew how to ski. So they accelerated along the list of tricks really quick. And that's what kind of happened in my case. So I started freestyle skiing at a later age, right? I was 13 years and basically everybody else in the freestyle team has been doing it since they were young, since they were little, you know, peeny weeny. 
don't get me wrong, it actually took me a long time to hit my first rail and send myself off an XL booter, but once I actually gained the confidence to do those things, the fundamentals I built in ski racing allowed me to progress pretty quick in the sport. After my first year on the team, I was able to hit some pretty big jib features. My favorite trick at the time was doing a 360 mute. And I think the biggest rotation I ever capped off was a 540. I made them look like the inside of a trash can, but buddy, I, I was still hyped. You could see me still rocking my race helmet here, buddy. I got absolutely ripped on for that, but trust me, aerodynamics, bro. They're key. Man, I had so much fun doing this. Like these were some of the best years of my life. There's something so wild about sitting on top of the hill, being scared shitless to try this new trick you're testing out. You have your coaches, your teammates up there with you, amping you up to try it. Once you point your skis down the hill, pop off the lip, actually put that trick down to your feet, buddy. Man, ah, you feel like an animal. <laughs> it's sick. Freestyle skiing, dude, it pumped my adrenal glands and I love an adrenal pump. For the first couple of years, I was just progressing at the club. I did a few small competitions, but nothing on a provincial scale yet. And I hadn't even broken my first bone. So needless to say, I was not initiated to the sport yet. But that quickly changed. I think it was my third year with the team. I was probably about 15 or 16 at the time. And I broke my first bone, dude. So get ready for this one. It's a heavy hitter. My thumb, man. <laughs> and holy cape. Real, on a real note, out of all the bones are broken. Thumb, man. Oh, that was the worst. Yikes. Ah, no, never again. I ended up breaking the other one, but like, look. It's just not okay. <laughs> now that was also the first year I competed in my first provincial competition. It was at Norquay, which is a mountain pretty close to the ski town Banff. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with these locations, but they're in the Great White North here, buddy. I don't know how I earned a spot to compete in this competition because I wasn't that great for my age group. There was a three set of tables here. So the first hit, you see that 540. And I did a switch one with some kind of sorry excuse for a safety grab and then get a 720 at the end there. I was pretty hyped on the seven, man. That was the first year I was tossing seven, so I was pretty stoked. After that competition, I started to take skiing a little bit more seriously. So I started air bagging a lot more, uh, putting more hours on different hills outside of practice. So when I was 17, I kind of competed in my first provincial tour. Uh, there was two events. So one was a big air competition at a mountain called Sunshine. And the other was a slope style event at Lake Louise. If you place top 10 in these two events, you'd earn yourself a spot at the junior national competition that was going down in Ontario. Here's some footage from the Big Air event in Sunshine. I was tossing a cork seven tail. It wasn't necessarily a podium worthy trick, but it still got me in the top 10, so I was pretty amped. Unfortunately, I don't have any footage of my actual comp run for Lake Louise here, but I got a couple clips from practice with my buddy Eli that you've seen on the channel. And I think my run on the three set of tables was doing that misty seven tail at the start there, backflip on the middle jump, and then a 900 on the last. Again, not necessarily a crazy run for my age group, but it did secure me within the top 10, meaning I did earn a place to go compete at the Junior Nats competition in Ontario. But fast forward a couple weeks later, I broke my wrist at practice. Oh. Yes, I could still ski with my broken wrist, but I wasn't about to make my parents pay for a flight to a competition where I wouldn't be able to cap one. All right, we're almost to the first back break. Hang in there. So even though I broke my wrist that year, I was extremely excited for next year's season because I kind of had a taste for high-end competition, right? Even just securing a spot at the Junior Nats was really exciting for me. So I really wanted to focus next season, a lot of time at the airbag to start working on dubs and you know getting my rail skills a little bit more top notch fast forward to the fall snow starts hitting the ground and we start sashing the bag give you some context this is what it looked like So it's getting later into the fall. The team and I have already had a couple bag sessions and I remember I was working really hard to qualify my cork nines. Previously at the bag, I had the rotation dialed in. I figured out the trick, but still to qualify that trick, I needed to do it about 30 times on the bag and then about another five times on snow. If you guys are unfamiliar with the sport, you do need to qualify all your tricks before you can actually toss them in a comp. Even if you toss a pitch perfect triple cork 1800, the judges will still disqualify you if the trick ain't qualified. So we're probably Probably about the third airbag session in that I've been trying these cork nines out and I remember that one in particular for obvious reasons you'll see in a minute but I, I just wasn't having it like I completely forgot how to do the trick it's like when you force your water down your trachea instead of your esophagus buddy like my epiglottis man she wasn't functioning 
first hit, I didn't get the proper axis, and then I landed on my side on the airbag, which is great. That's what the airbag's for. Second hit, do the exact same thing, land on my side. Third time, over rotate, pull it to my back. Fourth attempt, under rotated, went to my stomach, and this just went on and on and on. So it was the last few hits of practice, and I remember sitting there at the top, you know, visualizing the trick in my head, trying to figure out what I was doing wrong with my coach. And after a few minutes, I just put my noses over the drop-in ramp, pointed my skis down the hill, and just sent it, man. I said, well, I'm just gonna send this big because maybe airtime's my issue. Coming up to the jump, my cork is ready and set, pop off the lip, and everything's wrong, dude. I get extremely mangled in the air and then take another heavy slam on the airbag. Now, God bless airbags, dude. If I was tossing this on snow on a hard-packed park jump, injuries would be a lot worse, but taking continuous hits on an airbag throughout the day is not necessarily a good thing for your body. <laughs> After that slam, my body was okay. Like, it felt fine. It was obviously sore because I've been hiking all day and slamming on the airbag every single hit. But nothing felt broken. I felt functional. So I pop my skis off. I exit off the side of the airbag and I start hiking up the hill again. And about a quarter of the ways up, dude, I remember my legs just totally shut down. Like, they went completely numb, man. I can still remember the feeling to this day and I couldn't walk like I was stuck there no matter how hard I thought about it or how hard I tried I just could not walk such a scary moment in my life man it was so weird my buddy Eli was also hiking up beside me and he noticed that I just stopped walking he was like bro what's up what are you doing and I was sitting there confused like I, I wasn't in pain but my whole lower body was completely numbed and just said well dude I can't walk after 30 seconds or so, we both realized that, you know, something is definitely not right, obviously. <laughs> so my coach and my buddy carried me down to my car, and man, I remember it so vividly. Like, they sat me down on the car seat and then had to carry my legs into the vehicle. Like, dude, what a humbling moment. Again, the first bone I ever broke was my thumb, and dude, it left me bewildered that I couldn't move my thumb. If you've ever broken something, you'll know what I'm talking about, but it just leaves you in shock, right? You move your thumbs on a daily basis. You move your legs on a daily basis. And then to have that taken from you is just, there's no words for it. Fast forward a couple x-rays, a bone scan, and the doctors found out I did fracture my L5 vertebrae. It wasn't anything excessive, like it was a slight fracture in the bone. Nowhere near as Candide's like exploded vertebrae that happened after you cased that massive like 200 footer. But what's interesting is your sciatic nerve, the nerve that allows your legs to move, branches out at the L5 vertebrae. So the doctors said the reason why my legs went numb at the airbag site was because that fracture pinched that nerve. Great stuff, hey? Fantastic. <laughs> To avoid any confusion, I did not get paralyzed. I was able to walk after I got out of the car. But my goodness gracious, does a broken back ever suck? I remember for the first week, if I stood more than five minutes, my legs would go completely numb again, and then I'd have to lay down in my bed. I wasn't able to lift anything. I could barely walk around my house. I mostly just spent every single day lying in my bed. But that was more so for the first week that my back was broken. You know, each week that went by, I got progressively better. Uh, strength came back, bones started to heal. And after about two months time, I was actually able to get back on the skis and do a couple runs. Even though I was able to ski again, my doctor was really strict to say I should stop competing. I should stop trying to progress with the sport because there was a really high probability that I would actually sever the nerve if I refractured that vertebrae. So it was a really difficult decision for me to make, but eventually I did put up the skis. I quit competing, but I had the opportunity to become a coach on the freestyle team. So I went out, did my air one and air two qualification which are essentially two courses you need to take as a freestyle coach if you want to coach an athlete up to a single flip rotation. Being a ski coach, dude, sickest gig in the book, man. If you have the opportunity, take it. You're paid to go out and shred with your athletes in the mountains. And better yet, the parents often feel pretty bad because you were coaching their kids all day. So they'll take you down into the lodge after hours and buy you all the pitchers of beer you could ever imagine. There's no dental plan, but there's beer. Now as a coach, I never got back to the same level of skier I was when I was competing, but I was Still able to toss a couple flips and hit some jib features. Holy! That soon come to an end, you know, with the the second break. Yo, apparently I didn't listen to my doctor, buddy. How smart was I? Now to bring you up to speed on the life of Nicholas, I broke my back for the first time when I was 17. 
and I ended up ski coaching for two years. In my second year of coaching, I was graduated and I decided to take a year off the of university just to work and build up some lump sums of cash. I landed a job as a laborer for a commercial construction company. It was the only place I knew that allowed me to be dirty and receive decent pay at the same time. Started working there in the summer and made it all the way through March with relatively no issues to my back. I still got periodic numbing in my legs if I strained my back a lot that day, but for the most part, it wasn't too bad. But boy, did things change in March. So we were building this big urban barn to house a bunch of different animals at my city's local zoo. By March, the general structure was complete, so it was time to pour the slab. If you guys are unfamiliar with what a slab is, just think of it as a giant concrete floor for the barn. Now this is where it gets interesting, okay? Underneath the slab, there's a bunch of gravel. We can't get a bobcat into the barn because now it's really close quarters thanks to, you know, all the beams holding up the building. So somebody needed to volunteer to shovel a bunch of gravel inside of this barn. Nicholas, get your ass over here. Now hold this shovel, buddy, and get to work. <laughs> I was getting paid for good, hard, honest work, and that's pretty much the definition of shoveling gravel. So I had no complaints, but man, did it start taking a toll on my back after each and every week. I kid you not, I was shoveling gravel nine hours a day for about a month. Now after two weeks, the numbing and the pain was starting to get to the point that was dangerous and no longer manageable. So I came to the conclusion that I was gonna quit my job at the end of March and then go to Croatia. <laughs> But boy, did the good Lord have different plans for me, buddy. <laughs> now, I don't remember what day it was, but there was about a week left in the month. I was really close to quitting my job. And anyways, I show up to work one morning. We have our morning meeting. I go down to the sea can, grab my trusty shovel, head over to the barn. Within the first 10 minutes of my shift, I go over to the gravel pile, bend over with my shovel to pick up another load. And as I'm pulling the shovel out of that gravel pile, I feel the exact same feeling I had at the airbag site. My spine locked itself in that bent over position. I couldn't feel my legs. They went completely numb. And I stood there in absolute disbelief. Like my head wasn't necessarily in the barn, dude. I was thinking about all the other things I was gonna do after I finished this job. At the time, I really didn't think it was broken again. I just couldn't come to terms with how unfair that would be. Fast tracking the story, my doctor told me I probably didn't let my vertebrae heal long enough the first time I broke it, right? I only gave it two months before before I went back and started skiing. So all of this repetitive strain and stress that was onset from this job I was doing eventually cracked the same vertebrae once again. Oh man, I was pissed, dude. Livid, so mad. Oh wow, was I furious. I remember the appointment so well that he told me I'm never gonna be able to ski again never going to be able to do anything strenuous on my back for the rest of my life. And I should just be grateful that I'm able to walk and rightfully said, dude, like this could have been way worse than it was. I could have actually severed the nerve and become paralyzed, but I wasn't able to recognize how fortunate I was. I was too distracted, focusing on all the things that I was passionate about that got ripped away from me. This injury led to the darkest periods of my life, man. And it's a really sad, but really cool story to tell. And only by the grace of the good Lord, am I able to make videos like this now? But we'll save that story for another video. This is already almost 20 minutes. Yikes, sorry, man. I really wanted to make this video because as a lot of you guys know, this steep, steep YouTube channel, this thing we're doing here, uh, it wouldn't be in existence if it weren't for that injury. It blows my mind, dude, how the shit in your life can turn into beautiful petunias, man. It's crazy. Appreciate you guys so much, man. Thank you for watching this. I uh, hope it answered some of your questions about my past. Uh, you boys know I love you. You know the good. Go! Lord. Good Lord, man. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yes, sir. He loves you. We'll see you in the next one.